uh, welcome to everyone uh, to our weekly ITC lunch. Uh, we just uh, heard an excellent uh, colloquium by uh, Chris McKee that is visiting us from uh, UC Berkeley on the other end of the United States, uh, where things happen a bit differently, I guess. The weather is nicer, uh, the is doing well. Uh, and, um, Chris uh, spoke, of course, about star formation, a very interesting topic. He, he commented on the fact that uh, the, the surface density of molecular clouds can reach uh, roughly one gram per square centimeter, which I remind everyone is roughly the column density of your thumb. It's called the rule of thumb. Uh, and uh, it's also the, the, the average column density of the universe. Did, did you know That's right, the average column density of Of the universe. Oh. If you just take the mean density times the Hubble distance, you get roughly one gram per square centimeter. And it's also the critical density for gravitational lensing across this universe. So a very interesting number, one gram per square centimeter. Um, and uh, today we have a number of uh, talks in addition to Chris uh, speaking again in a few minutes. Um, uh, we'll hear first from Maciek uh, Wilgas, who is a fellow at the postdoctoral fellow at the Black Hole Initiative at the center down at Twenty Garden Street that uh, focuses on the study of black holes uh, from a distance. We do not encourage any of the postdocs to get too close. Um, and uh, Maciek will talk about char characterizing such a star time variability with the event horizon telescope. And after that, uh, we'll hear from uh, Jamie Bock, that is visiting us from Caltech. Where is Jamie? Oh, over there. Um, and Jamie will give us an update on the bicep keck uh, CMB polarization measurements. And that will be very interesting to hear. Um, and then we'll hear from uh, Sarab uh, Sims, that is visiting us. Uh, yeah. And he will tell us about uh, uh, Saras 2 which is a, a, an instrument to measure uh, the, uh, the 21 centimeter signal so from the, uh, the cosmic dawn. So he will talk about constraining the cosmic dawn and cosmological reionization uh, via the global redshift of 21 centimeter signal. Uh, and finally, we'll hear from uh, Chris McKee again, uh, and this time about the galactic corona. Much Hello everyone, um, I'm Maciek Vilgus, I'm delighted to uh, speak to you today uh, and I will be uh, talking about the uh, time variability of Sagittarius A star revealed by um, EHT. Oh, okay, maybe I will... Is that better? All right. So the, uh, very briefly, EHT is this uh, global network of uh, radio telescopes uh, that in April 2017 uh, observed a couple of sources, including uh, Sagittarius A star, which is uh, by many people co considered the most interesting uh, source. Uh, to, for you to appreciate uh, the problems uh, related to uh, time vari variability um, tests with VLBI, I would like to give you uh, an extremely quick crash course in, uh, in radio uh, astronomy. So the fundamental principle there is the one-sided uh, Zernik theorem. And I will be talking about apples and oranges because I enjoy, I like apples and I like oranges. But if the, this is too abstract, you are welcome to, uh, uh, to put a plasma creating or, or supermassive black hole in place of uh, an apple. The important thing is that uh, apple and oranges are uh, incoherent, that um, uh, there's, uh, there is a spatial incoherence uh, in the system. Uh, right, so if you look at that uh, system for, uh, from nearby, uh, when you look at apple, you see apple, you see apple photons. When you look at uh, the orange, you see orange photons. When you move a little farther away, however, uh, you will see a mixture of, of both. So if you, um, well, in other words, um, uh, partial coherence is, uh, is uh, sh showing up at the distance, and this is the uh, Van Sitter Zernik theorem. Since you have uh, partial coherence now, you can, uh, well, with, uh, with, with these two um, uh, fields will interfere. 
So you may calculate a correlation. And this correlation uh, between uh, apples and oranges uh, observed in different um, parts of your screen uh, is what is called visibility. And Van Seter's Zernick theorem basically just tells you uh, quantitatively what is the relation between um, visibility and the uh, uh, source um, uh, spatial distribution. And this, is, this turns out to be just a Fourier transform. Uh, be careful not to move too far away from your apples and oranges. Uh, if you move too far away, uh, you will not resolve the spatial structure of your uh, fruit salad. Uh, and uh, basically you will see a point source. Uh, there are high school relations governing um, uh, this um, uh, issue. Uh, when can you resolve um, uh, spatial structure? So basically if you plug uh, dimensions of uh, Sagittarius A star here and you put millimeter for your wavelength, uh, this value d will be about uh, uh, radius of, uh, uh, of the Earth. So this is why we need this uh, global network uh, of, of radio telescopes. Uh, each couple of uh, radio telescopes, each pair acts uh, as an uh, interferometer. So we have 15 interferometers in the array that uh, are resolving um, uh, st st spatial structure. 15 is not enough. Uh, Fortunately, there is a uh, thing called aperture synthesis as the Earth rotates. Uh, our geometry of the system is changing, and we are observing effectively more and more different um, uh, visibilities. Uh, the underlying assumption to reconstruct the image is that you are observing the uh, same thing uh, at each point of your track, so that the source is not changing during the experiment. Uh, well. This is typically true for VLBI uh, observations. However, if you calculate the characteristic time scales for Sagittarius A star, you will find that the orbital motion is, uh, happens on time scale of uh, less than half an hour, and light crossing um, time is uh, of about a minute. Uh, so there's no way you can assume that, um, uh, that the source is not changing uh, during uh, the experiment, which lasts hours. Uh, all right, so what can we do uh, from the point of view of the time domain uh, analysis? Let's try to uh, phrase uh, it in a simple uh, formalism. So we have distribution of intensity. Van Seiter Zernik tells us that this is a, a Fourier transform uh, re re related with visibilities with Fourier transform. Um, the easy thing to do, uh, the simplest possible uh, time variability is uh, constant modulation of flux. Uh, this is, however, uh, not the, uh, likely not the case for the uh, resolved uh, source. Th this is great for, uh, to describe a point source and variability of a point source. You would get uh, a light curve and uh, everyone is, uh, has done some light curve anal analysis at some point of his life. Uh, well, the reality, the harsh reality is, uh, is that uh, these uh, fluctuations uh, have both uh, structure in time and in space. So, for instance, there is a blob orbiting the, the black hole. It doesn't affect all, the, uh, all of the picture uh, with the same scaling uh, factor of intensity. It, it varies uh, uh, in different parts of, um, of uh, the image dom domain. Uh, well, so, so this formalism, uh, people who do think closest to, uh, to this one uh, are Michael uh, Johnson and Katie Bowman, who are doing... Um, uh, work in image domain with uh, time regularizations. I will uh, probably be able to show uh, a clip uh, a little later. What we are doing in the uh, time domain group is really we want to work on, uh, uh, on time series. Uh, so we kind of uh, say that uh, we, we separate um, uh, visibility uh, as a function of time. We, pull, we say that some part of that is um, uh, slowly varying, therefore we don't care, we can filter it uh, out. Um, so this is what we are doing. Well, not exactly. Uh, it would be so nice if we could use visibilities. Unfortunately, these are not good quantities to work with. Uh, in order to understand why is that, let's uh, look at the errors. We understand thermal errors so well. But on the top of the thermal errors in our system, there are multiple of different systematic errors. And both systematic errors happen on the time scale that we are interested in, in minutes and uh, uh, seconds, like the effects of the uh, variation in the, in the atmosphere. Uh, 
And I, I really wanted to, uh, to show that because it's one of the greatest sentences ever phrased in English language, in my opinion. I, uh, and uh, I don't really know uh, Donald Rumsfeld, but I'm sure he, he is a great observer with this kind of uh, in insightfulness. Um, Right, and it, it exactly describes uh, the problems with a co any kind of complex uh, metrological system. Uh, okay, so what's the problem with uh, visibilities? They, they, have, uh, they are influenced by station-based errors. This is only one of the problems with them. So if you are feeling that you are looking at Sagittarius A star and you are plotting wonderful power a spectrum of uh, magnetorotational instability, what you actually can be seeing is uh, the, the weather condition uh, above the At Atacama Desert. Uh, we don't want that, although th that is also uh, fascinating, I'm sure. Uh, right, fortunately, there exist quantities, there exist algebraical way to get rid of uh, those uh, station-based gain terms. Uh, so we can work on so-called closure uh, quantities, and two examples are closure phases and closure uh, amplitudes. So how would it work uh, in practice? This is a simulation uh, prepared by Hotaka Shiokawa. Uh, this is ray traced GRMHD simulation. So uh, we fake uh, an observation in which we place this movie in a location of Sagittarius A star. We observe it with uh, fake array, just by uh, numerical procedures, according to the schedule that uh, was used in April uh, last year for the actual observations. And we try to figure out whether in closure quantities we see uh, the uh, related variability. And we do the same experiment for a single frame. So, uh, so everything that we observe is just a static frame like this one. And of course, for uh, control uh, reasons, uh, we also observe uh, just the point source. All right, so let's see uh, what kind of closure uh, phases will we get. This is a point source. Nothing, nothing ha uh, interesting happening here. If you look at the statistics of this noise, this will very nicely be described as uh, Gaussian normal uh, thermal noise. Uh, if you look at the static source, uh, you already see something. It's, it, it is a static source. Why, why is there uh, variability in time? Well, of course, this is just your triangle uh, moving as the Earth is rotating and probing different parts of the spectrum. So, of course, there is some spatial variation in, in the source, and this is really a spatial variation that, that you just discover it um, uh, in time. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the actual time varying observation. So you see that apart from the, wow, that was quick. Um, apart from all this um, uh, variation, so I have two more minutes. Is that correct? That was the end, but you can have All right. No, OK, I'll just, uh, I'll just wrap it up then. Uh, 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 all right. Uh, so the idea here is since that we see uh, such a huge variability, uh, when we are actually dealing with the time varying uh, uh, signal, simple idea how to determine whether there is this uh, component of intrinsic time variability is just to calculate quantity like this one. So if you calculate that, it should be zero if uh, everything is explained by the thermal noise or known uh, sources of error. It should be about one, about unity, if the dominant uh, uh, source of variability is the intrinsic uh, time variability. So you see how nicely it works. Point source, zero. Uh, static image, well, effectively zero. And a, a blob, orbiting blob, about 0 0.9. So this is uh, one of the ways uh, to, to determine whether uh, there is an uh, intrinsic variability in our uh, source. I will very br briefly show that. This is what uh, Michael Johnson and Katie Bowman are doing. Uh, this is a slightly different thing. This is happening in, uh, in the image domain. So now you see that image is reconstructed uh, with a dynamical regularizer. So it has some information about, uh, uh, about different frames, uh, uh, making, uh, uh, well, effectively forcing the continuity in the image. They are very close to perfect approach, in my opinion. Right, and uh, I'll leave you with the summary and I await your questions. Well, 
So, so beautiful about cl uh, clo thing about closure quantities is that they are invariant to uh, to that. So, and this is a very nice property of those quantities. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> we're, we're looking forward. Oh, uh, well, the, yeah, yeah, the, the April data. Of course, I'm not allowed to show any results from the from the actual data set. So I can only show some simulations. Yeah, I'll be happy to tell you more. Okay, I'm going to present the um, state of the bicep keck uh, measurements of microwave background polarization. Um, it's a little bit strange here to not be speaking with John Kovac, my close colleague, uh, who uh, obviously is playing an important role. And uh, through um, mutual confusion, um, he's actually giving a very similar talk today in Canada. <clears throat> okay, Joe, so just to catch you up on where we are with uh, measurements, this is a summary of the state of the field as of last year. So what we're doing is we're measuring um, a polarization pattern in the microwave background described by this swirly B mode. Any polarization pattern you can break apart to E modes and B modes. The B modes are the part that changes sign in a mirror. And that's an indicator of, uh, of uh, gravitational waves, or more precisely, some process that would not be a scalar fluctuation or a density fluctuation which doesn't know it's left from its right, and therefore only produces this kind of E-mode polarization. So what you see here is a plot of the um, amplitude of B-mode polarization called power spectrum. The signal uh, from inflation is this bump here peaking at a multipole of about um, 80, which is an angular scale in the sky about 2 degrees. Uh, this component at higher uh, multipoles is due to gravitational lensing. Uh, distortion of the background entirely E-mode polarization signal, which is brighter and component gets turned into B-modes. Uh, the amplitude of the inflationary signal is unknown. We're trying to detect and, cons and or constrain it. And uh, you can see this history of upper limits here, some detections of the lensing signal, including bicep keck, and then this is the data from bicep keck in 2014. <clears throat> Uh, also, this is the entire history of, uh, of um, measurements of uh, the inflationary uh, B-mode uh, amplitude. So it's parameterized by something called R, which is the ratio of tensor modes, gravitational waves from inflation, to scalar fluctuations. Uh, and um, you know, typical uh, slow roll inflation models put this somewhere around 1% um, or so, but other models could have a very low level. Okay, so this is the error on R through time, and you can see the green are um, results from our collaboration, the error. So these are getting really exquisite. We're now at an error uh, in 2014 of 2.4%, and this, as, you'll, as I'll show, is going to continue marching down. The field is uh, active, um, and we're expecting measurements from our competitors to, to start to show up here. Okay, so what's new? In, in 2015, we've made these maps. These, this is um, a map of CMD polarization, but not B-mode polarization. These are maps of E-mode polarization, which is a bright signal uh, of about one microkelvin. 
Okay, so not really very bright uh, at all. Um, here are maps at 95 gigahertz, 150 gigahertz, and what's new is now we have maps at 220 gigahertz, which allow us to assess for the first time, these are the first measurements at this depth ever made, which are, are now allowing us to assess the um, contribution from galactic dust, which, which rises up here at higher frequencies. And I think you can see that these measurements are doing a good job. These structures are actually detected with pretty good signal to noise and uh, detected pretty well at 220 where life is definitely harder. The atmosphere is worse and the microwave background is fainter. <clears throat> okay, so now if you can get your head around this plot, this, this dis will describe the importance of, of doing these measurements in multiple frequencies. Okay, so this is the amplitude at that peak of multipole. Uh, angular scale of about two degrees. This is the power um, in, in, in that bin. Uh, what you see here in flat units versus frequency is the spectrum of the microwave background. Okay, so a microwave background component will look flat. And um, dust, galactic dust, has this blue spectrum. The, the shaded area is currently how well we can constrain the amplitude. And uh, the other way the galaxy emits is in synchrotron here at low frequencies. That's currently an upper limit in, in, in this red area. So um, we know there's dust in our region, so that has you know, reduced the amplitude. But uh, it's not just the amplitude, it's the errors on the dust that are the problem. So um, you can see here Planck at high frequencies has the best information on dust without getting mixed up with the uh, CMB. There's a big contrast here between dust and the CMB. But you can see the signal to noise on the dust is very, very modest here at high frequencies. Our best channel is at 150 gigahertz. So that's the most sensitive channel to um, galactic dust. And therein lies the problem. The raw sensitivity here at 150 is well below 1%. But by the time we do the component subtraction deal with the dust, those errors get, get blown up. So now we have 220 data for the first time, yay. And that 220 data also is about as good as Planck. This is two receiver years um, up through 2015. That's why we call it BK15. Um, but, but not bad, not bad. And uh, we also have the cross spectra between um, uh, frequencies. So here's 150 cross 353. That's a very good, our best monitor of dust currently. And now 150 cross 220 is, is comparable. Um, we have more data. It's not 2015. That's, we, it's 2017. And so, uh, well, data that we've completed. And um, so this shows how things will move down in 2017. We're sitting on a lot of data. Um, instead of having two receiver years at 220, we're going to have 10. Um, and we have a new instrument called BICEP3. I'll show you some stuff coming from that. That's going to improve the situation out here dramatically. And where we expect we'll be at the end of of this analysis, which we're just starting, is that uh, instead of being limited by dust, we'll be limited by synchrotron. So that low frequency measurements will become important. Uh, there's been an uh, ongoing debate in the community about the properties of dust, how, how well dust is described, how many parameters you need. Uh, there's this um, a bugbear called dust decorrelation, which means perhaps um, if you look at one frequency, if dust has mixed components, when you measure at another frequency, you don't have all the information. And so the, the, there will be some decorrelation between these two bands. So Planck, in 2016, uh, reported a detection of, of, of decorrelation uh, at more than 99% confidence. And so we spent a lot of time, uh, Victor especially, figuring out, one, one of uh, John's uh, students, how to um, deal with this in our um, analysis. This month, Paul came out with another paper which says, we find no evidence of a loss of correlation. <laughs> <laughs> so it's actually pretty difficult to um, measure this. And, um, but uh, th they say, you know, going down to 1%, maybe that's OK, given the constraints they can put on this. We, you know, we expect there's going to be dust decorrelation as you go fainter and fainter, because dust certainly is has a mixture of components. OK, here's data. Um, this is not simulated. This is real data. So you can see um, here um, uh, just a small set of our 
auto and cross spectra. If I showed you all of them, it would they'd be tiny, fill the whole page with all the bands we have. Um, here, here is the E mode uh, in green, uh, very, very uh, high signal to noise. And then B modes in pink note the big change in scale from log to linear. Um, the red line you should pay attention to. So that, that's a model which just has um, dust as constrained from BK14 plus lensing and no R component. And you can see the data here at 220 are consistent with that model. And here in the cross between 150 and 220 are also consistent with that model at about the same sensitivity that we have with the, with the Planck data. And so now we're just for the first time able to do some tests of the properties of, of dust um, on, on our own two feet. Okay, this is not real data. This is a simulation because we haven't put this out yet. But this shows the constraints from the BK14 analysis in red and if we didn't change the, media, the, 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 the peak of this histogram, where we would be with BK15. Okay, so uh, this is R. You can see the likelihood uh, here and how it tightens up a bit with the, the 2015 data. This is the amplitude of dust. Uh, this is uh, syn synchrotron. And we put in priors on the properties of dust that come to us from Planck. The d dust is pretty well described by just a few parameters so far at the level of, of Planck sensitivity, which is the spectral index of dust, the spectral index of synchrotron, um, possible correlation between dust and synchrotron, and their spatial indices. We can turn on or turn off these priors. And so the baseline analysis we're doing assumes this, but then we have lot, can have lots of fun turning on and off our priors, um, turning on and off data from WMAP and Planck to show how, um, how, how well we're doing just with our own internal data. We can turn on or off a correlation between EE and BB and dust, and turn on or off in a certain amount of dust decorrelation. If I can just have two more minutes. Uh, this is a little movie that just shows now what's happening. Um, but what, well, actually, what's happened. This is 20, going back in time. This is 2014 data. So what you see here is a map in um, a Stokes polarization parameter. That's real data. This is an estimate of the noise. So things are getting better, getting better. And now in 2016, you'll start to see here new data from, from um, BICEP3, uh, which is really nice. Um, <coughs> clearly see structure here in the Q Stokes parameter. The noise is, is good, and this um, instrument is working um, notably better in 2017. So we, we know this data is going to be great, and we're eager to get to that. And then finally, um, as we look down the road, we're going to need more information. And so there's something called the BICEP array, uh, which has four large aperture um, receivers. We're in the process of, of building this. Our first receiver is going to actually run at low frequencies here. And uh, it's got a huge focal plane of detectors, um, about this big, all cooled to 250 millikelvin to get as much sensitivity as, uh, as we can. And the march in the future looks something like this. Um, this bottom plot shows our um, forecasted sensitivity on R. This is where we'll be with BK15. BK17 will march down to about an R of a percent. As we get more and more sensitive, it becomes important to remove the lensing signal. That is a cosmic foreground. So we're waiting on data from um, high angular resolution CMD uh, polarimetry measurements with um, SPT pole. And when those are um, available, uh, we can significantly improve this just by subtracting the lensing signal. The noise from the lensing signal uh, is already non-negligible. Non and then you can see here, as soon as we turn on the low frequency array from, um, from bicep array, this, this notable jump, I mean, small now. All these changes um, are, you know, we're talking a factor of 20%, that sort of drop. But, but this is just due to getting better knowledge on the synchrotron. So uh, we hope to have this paper out soon. Um, and I'll, I'll not quantify it further. Thank you. How far behind? 
I'm not quite sure. Um, I, In terms of raw sensitivity, I would say ActPole is uh, the closest. They have receivers that are, are on the sky and doing well. And um, what we haven't seen from them yet is how well it works on these large scales. Because with a larger telescope, controlling systematics on degree scales is a challenge. So they, you know, that, that's what I'm most concerned about with those big telescopes. And there's, there's nothing out yet, so it's hard to predict. Well, there's no data. I mean, I, I know, I know, the, I know the sensitivity in terms of raw horsepower, but or approximately. But I, what I don't know is how how well they'll do on these large scales. They could be. Well, the best information on the large-scale properties of dust are coming to us from Planck, which is map, you know, map the polarization um, over the whole sky. And, and as I said, to um, maybe even a surprising degree, it's pretty well described by the basic parameters we have in our fiducial analysis. And they're, they're, you know, they're, they're modest changes as you look over the sky, but, but pretty well described by the standard model. Um, of course, they don't have the sensitivity to go in on these very um, diffuse patches and see if the physics might be different. Um, so you know, ultimately, we want to have enough sensitivity that we don't have to rely on all sky types of parameterization, but we're not there yet. Could you say a bit about the technology in your 30 to 40 uh, gigahertz uh, ranges? Were there any, what were the challenges of, of extending down? Um, well, so far, I, I think um, we feel everything gets easier as you go to lower frequencies. Um, there's fewer detectors, and the things that usually cause problems um, are, seem to be more forgiving at the lower frequencies. The, everything is larger physically. Um, at the high frequencies, uh, we do have a technology challenge, I think. We're talking about 20,000 detectors at that point in the focal plane. Bicep 3 is about 10% of that number. Um, so <clears throat> especially looking into the future for S4, talking about half a million detectors, seems like um, we need an improved way of multiplexing large number of detectors, which is something we're working on. Well, I think one thing we've learned is that the polarization fraction over the sky is not very easily predictable. That the, the variation in the polarization fraction do, does vary quite a bit. And if you just look at the intensity and apply a standard model, it very much depends um, what patch of sky you get. I think there's another question. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. One has to always worry about systematics. And so there are long papers that we've written and others about, you know, how well we control systematics. Some of them we measure and constrain through difference tests, and some of them we measure and constrain through very precise measurements of our beams and so forth. And so there is a, um, an, an element of systematic error that we, that we bookkeep. And, um, you know, we, we, if you look at the systematics error, paper, we can control systematics or errors below a percent, but, but, you know, as we get down here, I think we have to worry, start to look at it more carefully.
Am I audible? Okay. So I'll be talking about uh, SARES-2, which is an experiment to detect global 21 centimeter from epoch of reionization. Uh, just to have a quick overview of what uh, we are actually interested in, is this particular time when the first structures in the universe formed. And uh, we have some observables to say that, okay, uh, things got completed by redshift of six, which means to say that the predominantly neutral uh, universe by redshift of six became completely ionized. And this is what we termed as epoch of reionization, but we really don't understand a lot about this particular epoch. And uh, one of the things is the nature of the sources themselves that really caused this reionization, and also the timeline. So various sub-processes, when they really occurred in this, we don't understand. So one of the ways to really study this is through the 21 centimeter uh, hydrogen emission. We know it's a spin-flip transition and uh, with a rest frequency of uh, 1420 megahertz. Uh, what is interesting here is that uh, this signal gives us a direct picture of reionization, which means to say that at a given redshift, we know at what frequency should we be expecting the signal at. So what we want to look at is the brightness temperature of this line at different frequencies, which means at different redshifts. So we are trying to probe uh, epoch of reionization directly. But then, easier said than done, there are lots of challenges which we face uh, when we try to aim to detect such a weak signal. And then, uh, so this signal, when you look at between, say, 40 megahertz to 200 megahertz, we are predominantly uh, dominated by the synchrotron emission from galaxies and extragalactic sources. Uh, the signal can, at maximum, be a few hundred millikelvins. And in the same frequency range, the foregrounds could be something from hundreds of kelvins to tens of thousands of kelvin, depending on which part of the sky we are looking at. On top of that, because it's a ground-based experiment, we are also uh, dominated by various radio frequency sources uh, of terrestrial origins, which we call as RFI. And the most critical component here is the instrument itself, which has multiplicative and additive contributions uh, to the actual data. And the challenge is to be really being able to solve for the instrument, detect all these outliers, and finally be able to separate out the foregrounds to say something about the signal. So basically it needs an analysis which is accurate to one part in 10 raised to six. And uh, so the radiometer that we have developed uh, takes care of the fact that the response from the system itself is uh, spectrally smooth. And the motivation of doing that is because one of the ways we can really separate out foregrounds from signal is from the fact that the foregrounds are spectrally smooth because it is predominantly synchrotron, which is uh, close to a power law, while the signal has a lot of spectral characteristics. Uh, one thing to note here is this is not a very uh, deterministic signal. Depending on the model of reionization that we take, this can have substantial variations. So, uh, right. So the way we quantify uh, this uh, smoothness is by something called maximally smooth function which is a constrained polynomial in which it does not allow zero crossings of high order derivatives, which means to say that the polynomial does not have inflection points. So this property holds good for the foregrounds, which has been shown by uh, some uh, works, but we want to ensure that our instrument itself follows the same property so that we can really s separate out the systematics and foregrounds from the, and to study something about the signal. So this is how uh, the system looks like. At this point, I should just like to clarify that what we are looking at is an absolute measurement of the sky, uh, which means to say that we, we are interested in the mean levels of the brightness and not the fluctuations. So angular resolution is not a problem, but the control of systematics is the major concern. Uh, so we have an antenna and the receiver right in the field, which is integrated into a single unit. And then at the back, we have a filtering stage, which basically filters out all the signals beyond 40 to 200 megahertz. And finally, we have a cross-correlator system, which does a Fourier transform and generates the sky spectra. And why this particular design? I'll just spend a couple of slides on that. So the antenna, which we are using for this experiment, has a frequency-independent beam, which means to say that uh, at all frequencies between 40 to 200, it would be looking at the same region of the sky, which is important because if the frequency, uh, this beam starts being a frequency-dependent, it can introduce a lot of spectral features. Uh, the second uh, characteristic is the transfer function of the antenna. Basically, so the, when we have a sky, the coupling of the sky to the system is not 100% all the time. It is governed by something called total efficiency, 
So we have made sure that this transfer function through which the sky really couples to the system uh, does not have any deeply embedded frequency structures or does not have inflection points because anything here would be directly imprinted on the data and it will just make the analysis more challenging. Similarly, so this was about the antenna and the whole receiver also has been designed with the same concern in mind. So we have ways in which we can really get rid of the frequency characteristics of these all the components, which we call as bandpass calibration. We also have phase switching schemes through which we can cancel the crosstalks in the system. And finally, I think one of the biggest challenges in these global 21 centimeter experiments is the multipath propagation of the signals itself. Uh, and uh, we have ensured by the design of it that the multipath propagation also does not introduce the usual sinusoidal variations, but only introduces a very low order term. Once we have the uh, system in place, we also have developed the whole pipeline through which we can get to the cleaned data, which means that we have to do the calibration of it. We also have to pick up those outliers that come from radio frequency interference. And uh, once we have the clean data, we can adopt different methods of analysis to see how deep we can go. And we have a, have a dual modeling approach. The first one is the physically motivated measurement equation itself which means that uh, we can actually devise the signal, uh, the, uh, lay out all the signal path here and predict what kind of spectra we should be seeing. But because this whole instrument we know is uh, guaranteed to have a maximally smooth response, we can actually use uh, constraint polynomials to be able to model the systematics. So we use both these approaches on the internal systematics. So like this is one of the examples of the spectra that we see. and. Uh, Based on this uh, measurement equation and smooth functions, we can actually reduce it all the way to the noise levels without being uh, limited by any systematic structure. Now with this in mind, we have over the last one year uh, started observing at different radio quiet zones in India and uh, have something like 60 hours of data. From here on, we want to now try to constrain EOR depending on the data that we have. And the path that we take is driven by these theoretically generated signals of uh, 21 centimeter. Uh, this is one of the works which our collaborator, Anastasia, who is an ITC fellow and her team, have done it. And uh, this is basically a playing around with different parameters of uh, early universe, which we really don't understand what is the kinds of variation that it will have. So we all explore this parameter space of all these different parameters to generate the theoretical possibilities of how the signal should be like. So what we do is we take these signals uh, and try to see whether our data is consistent with any of them or can we really rule out some of the signals. So the data, when we subtract out the foregrounds and systematics, we go all the way to thermal noise limits of RMS of 12 millikelvin, which shows a dynamic range of one part in 65,000 and, uh, and it's uh, predominantly Gaussian random noise. So now we can ask this question, uh, given a signal like this, is it uh, uh, consistent with this data or it's more consistent with noise? So we do a simple likelihood ratio test for this and uh, derive the confidence limits on uh, how good or how bad is the rejection of the signals. So with this kinds of analysis, we have been able to rule out a certain class of models from the theoretical, theoretically generated uh, 21 centimeter signals. The second approach is more frequentist as a forward modeling, which is here, sorry, yeah, uh, in which we have a foreground component along with the signal and we do a joint modeling and look at the kinds of uncertainties that we have. And then we try to uh, see whether we can really rule out the signals from this approach. And again, uh, based on that, we have been able to rule out something like 10% of theoretically motivated signals but then the question is, once we have ruled out the signals, can we say something about EOR? And it seems like yes. Uh, so the kinds of scenarios that we are able to rule out is basically uh, rapid reionization with uh, X-ray sources having very poor heating efficiency. So all these models here that we have ruled out belong to the same class. Uh, we can go a step further and try to quantify this. So for uh, uh, X-ray heating efficiency, this is the relation uh, which we observe in the local universe, that doublometric luminosity is related to star formation rate. Uh, with this normalization factor Fx being put in, because we really don't know how this relation holds at very high redshift, which is pretty much unconstrained, at least from the data that we have got, we have tried to place a limit saying that it should be greater than 0.1. Uh, 
similarly, for rapid reionization scenario, one of the ways in which it can happen is uh, very large mean free paths of the UV photons. So we have again tried to place a limit saying that very large mean free paths, something like 70 megaparsecs, are not really favored with the current data. So, uh, wow. Okay, so I'll just want to conclude saying that yes, SARS-2 uh, has been designed to have a maximally smooth transfer function, which enables us to separate the foregrounds and systematics and try to constrain the signals. Currently, we have been able to reject 10% of the theoretically plausible signals uh, generated this way, but again, this is not an exhaustive list, and given some more exotic mechanisms, we can also have other signals. And uh, currently, we are trying to place constraints on the real astrophysical parameters and this is the first uh, time when a global 21 centimeter experiment has been able to constrain such uh, kinds of parameters. I'll just like to thank uh, the entire SARS-2 team for this, along with the observatory supports that we have got. Thank you. Right. Right. Exactly. So right now, the kinds of models that we have basically denotes a very cold IGM. So the X-ray sources have not been able to heat it up. Uh, so at, at, at that redshift, uh, so what we measure here is basically the differential between the matter temperature and the CMB temperature. So uh, something like uh, uh, 250 to 100 millikelvin kinds of differentials exist right now. Uh, kinetic temperature, I'm not sure about. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that I understood exactly what was ruled out about the X-ray emission. Mm -hmm. um, can you say a little bit more about the, the timing at which it would have kicked in? You know, what, what's ruled out about the times at which the X-rays became important? Or right. whether they're diffuse within regions where there are stars or whether mm -hmm. they're central in galaxies. Is that part of what you... Right. So regarding X-ray sources, there are two things. One is uh, here we are trying to rule out uh, very late heating of through X-ray sources. So we, we called it actually very late heating because this corresponds to uh, uh, redshifts of around uh, of, uh, 10 or so in which the X-ray turns on. And the second is the heating efficiency itself, which means that once the X-ray sources turn on, how rapidly they can heat the IGM uh, to CMB temperature or above, because initially the gas is very cold. So what we are saying is uh, that with the current uh, relation that we have uh, here, uh, so the worst case is suppose X-ray sources don't heat at all, so in this case it's just zero. What we are saying is compared to the current universe, they need to have an efficiency uh, at least more than 10% uh, from a no heating case. Mm -hmm. So this is very nice then. You're putting rather general constraints which don't depend on specific models of no. how the X-rays are Right. This is, yeah, this is pretty much independent of the SED or hard or soft FX and those things. We have tried to play around with different X-ray sources, but this is pretty robust. Thank you. Yes. Right. So it very much depends on um, what band of analysis we have chosen. Uh, so in this particular band, uh, the foregrounds are more smooth. So that's why. Uh, so, so the basic question is whether we need inflection points. We do we need uh, the, uh, cro uh, zero crossings in derivatives to be able to fit the foregrounds and the signals. So the answer is that foregrounds can be fitted uh, without uh, introducing zero crossings, while these signals cannot be. So this is the kind of uh, boundary between the two. So we can fit out the foregrounds, but we can preserve the uh, spectral characteristics of the signal itself. Yes. <laughs> Great. Yeah, so actually, uh, I think uh, there are uh, around five experiments right now which are aiming at global 21 centimeter. Edges is doing uh, quite good. So in the term, if you just talk about in terms of sensitivity levels here, uh, they are very similar. Um, so this is uh, something like 12 millikelvin, which is close to what they have achieved. Oh, we are talking about it. Right. 
Right, right, right. So actually, their last results, which came out in the high band, 100 to 200 megahertz, also aims to rule out rapid reionization scenarios. So there is a kind of overlap in the kinds of results, but in future, yes, uh, collaboration is also a possibility. Right. Right. Exactly. So right now there are two things here. Uh, one is the uh, integration time that we require to beat the noise further down. So there is another. Right now it's in the process of upgrade. So uh, this summer around um, April or May we are planning another observation. So that is one. And the second is, uh, right now, the efficiency of antenna itself we are also planning to enhance, which can also result in much better sensitivities. So you're limited by just cross sensitivities. Right. It's not systematic limited right now. Yes. Thank you. Okay, how did the... Okay, so uh, now I want to uh, describe some work that I've been doing in collaboration with uh, Jakob Fehrman and uh, Emil Sternberg on the galactic uh, corona. And, uh, it, so appropriate to begin with a classic paper that Lyman Spitzer wrote um, a number of decades ago in which he speculated on the existence of the galactic corona long before there were any uh, X-ray, UV, or any kind of measurements that actually indicated that it was uh, present. So um, one of the key questions that uh, we'd be interested in addressing is where are the galactic baryons? So if we look at a mass model of the uh, galaxy, then we have virial masses of uh, order of 10 to the 12 solar masses. And if you count, uh, you know, count up all the baryons that are in stars and gas, you get a significantly smaller number of 6 or 7 times 10 to the 10th. Now, the expected baryon mass, based on the results of the Planck collaboration, are about 16% of the virial mass. So uh, you can see that instead of uh, the, the 6 or 7 times 10 to the 10th that we see, you expect maybe 16 to 24 times 10 to the 10th. So where are that missing uh, uh, baryons? Were they expelled from the galactic halo, or perhaps they're still sitting there in the galactic uh, corona? So uh, what we want to do is to try to develop a simple phenomenological model that will explain the data. And the interesting thing is we have uh, a number of independent uh, observations of the, uh, that relate to the galactic corona, and it's, uh, people are trying to simulate it, uh, but even just trying to come up with a simple phenomenological model is also a challenge. And the data that we have available, uh, first of all, are on the uh, oxygen 7 and 8 absorption lines. And these you see whenever you look at uh, distant uh, quasars or uh, Seifert galaxies, for example, that are very luminous in X-rays. And we have uh, argued that they are uh, arise in the galaxy and not in the local group uh, based on the fact that you do not see absorption lines in other local groups, or I'm sorry, other groups of galaxies uh, toward uh, quasars. Then uh, there are also uh, data on emission, X-ray emission lines, and uh, both oxygen 7 and 8. And I want to emphasize that this requires a lot of uh, sophisticated analysis on the part of the X-ray astronomers because the signal uh, is this uh, green line here. And you can see that it's uh, significantly less than uh, what is actually observed. Uh, but nonetheless, they uh, are able to uh, determine what the uh, total intensity is and infer a temperature of order uh, a few million degrees. 
Then one of the things that I found most striking was the uh, observation by Tomlinson et al., or where they um, went ahead and looked at the uh, a number of galaxies uh, in absorption against uh, distant uh, uh, quasars and uh, uh, observed oxygen-6 absorption lines out to a very large distance, out to essentially the, the virial radius. So this is a summary of the uh, data from uh, different uh, galaxies. And uh, subsequent, uh, after this uh, original observation by Johnson and all, show that, in fact, the uh, strength of the absorption lines does drop significantly at uh, about the virial radius. The black line is a model, which I'll uh, describe later. And another observational fact is that the line width is greater than the thermal width, so it suggests that the lines are turbulently broadened. So another piece of uh, interesting evidence on these lines is that they uh, appear to arise in star-forming galaxies. Those are the galaxies on the right in the blue, uh, whereas uh, the early type galaxies, um, which are not star-forming, uh, you uh, generally do not see the oxygen-6. So it has to do uh, the oxygen-6, the presence of oxygen-6 does appear to be related either to the active star formation or it could also just be that the early type galaxies are more massive and have hotter halos so that they uh, uh, don't have oxygen-6. And there's some other data that is indirectly uh, gives you more information on the corona. And one is that if you look at, for example, the Magellan Extreme, there uh, people have made models of that, and that's uh, H1 gas that has been stripped out of the uh, Magellanic cloud, and you need densities of order 10 to the minus 4 particles per cubic centimeter in order to explain that. Uh, and you also have that the uh, uh, dispersion measure uh, measuring to radio pulsars in the uh, Magellanic clouds gives you an upper limit of uh, about 23 uh, cubic centimeters uh, parsecs. And finally, I should have actually gone on more on the ramp pressure stripping. So if you look at the local group dwarfs, you see that dwarfs that are inside a few hundred uh, uh, kiloparsecs have stripped of gas, whereas dwarf <coughs> galaxies that are outside that uh, can still have gas. Now, theorists, of course, have been uh, very actively involved in this as well. And there was a classic paper by Senna and Ostreicher a uh, number of years ago where they uh, first suggested that a lot of the baryons were hiding in the intergalactic medium, including in uh, galactic chronic. This is a model from my uh, colleagues at, uh, at uh, well, including my colleagues at Berkeley, where they have uh, modeled a uh, galaxy, an L star type galaxy in which they include the effects of star formation, but they do not include the effect of the uh, growth of the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. Um, and that uh, type of AGN activity could actually be a, a very significant additional heating component. But they are able to get, uh, in their computer, they can get models which are at least qualitatively consistent with some of the observations that I've described. So what we want to do, as I mentioned, is come up with just a simple phenomenological uh, model for this. And what we're going to do in making uh, this model is we're going to assume that the gas is in hydrostatic equilibrium. It's in a spherical gravitational potential, and we took that from the uh, literature. Um, we're going to include uh, turbulent uh, cosmic ray and magnetic pressure, and we're going to assume that the gas is in collisional ionization equilibrium. Now, we published a paper in which we uh, went ahead with those assumptions. We made the additional assumption that uh, the uh, corona was isothermal. So there was enough heating to try to keep uh, the hot gas up to about a million and a half degrees. In order to explain the oxygen-6, we assume that the, uh, this million and a half degree gas, some of it would cool off, and that would cool down to a few hundred thousand degrees, and that would then account for the uh, uh, oxygen-6. But what I want to describe today is uh, the current model, which is uh, instead of assuming that it's isothermal, we assume that it's adiabatic. Uh, and then uh, we have both uh, the uh, thermal gas with an adiabatic index of five-thirds and a uh, non-thermal gas. We model both the cosmic rays and magnetic field as a gas with uh, going, pressure going like rho to the four-thirds. So the input parameters uh, we put in are the density at the burial radius, the temperature at the burial radius. I should say that's comparable to the post-shock temperature that you would expect at the burial radius. Uh, and then the metallicity. And we have a metallicity, which we uh, put in a, a power law, and uh, it's uh, down to a couple of tenths of solar at the virial radius, and then it rises so that it's almost solar at the solar radius. And then uh, the non-thermal pressure is equal to the thermal pressure at the virial radius. 
the turbulent velocity is constant. Uh, they, we took a, me a measured value estimated from the observations, 60 kilometers per second. And then in this case, rather than forming, we're going to be able to account for the oxygen 6, oxygen 7, and oxygen 8, all the ions just with the hot component of the gas. We're, however, the, some of the gas does cool off, and it cools down to the gas which is observed at 21 centimeters in Lyman alpha, and uh, that we assume is present for gas that has a cooling time less than a dynamical time. So then this implies that the pressure at the solar radius is uh, a little bit less than what we uh, observe at the solar radius, which is a, certainly would have to be an upper limit, and that the uh, thermal pressure at the variable radius is about 8 uh, kelvins per cubic centimeter, which is comparable to what you would expect. So these are the results that we get in comparison with observation, and you can see that uh, we've done, uh, this model does uh, remarkably uh, well. Uh, so we're able to account for the oxygen 7 and 8 absorption and the, uh, the ratio of those two, the dispersion measures consistent with the upper limit, then the, for the uh, two of the um, uh, emission lines, uh, the 22 angstrom one is uh, a little bit low. The uh, 19 angstrom one is uh, essentially uh, right on the observation. The last number, actually, this shouldn't have been in the table. This last number was an input, not an uh, uh, output. So um, then one of the things that uh, a number of years ago I worked on a paper with John Slavin in which we uh, worked out the uh, X-ray background due to old supernova remnants, and this in this model, this particular model has uh, does not have much room for contribution by those uh, old supernova remnants. So if we then look at the density, this is a plot of the density. The red line is the hot gas, and then the blue line is the gas that cooled off and uh, uh, formed this gas is formed 10 or 20 thousand degrees, and the density at around 50 kiloparsecs at the distance to the uh, LMC is indeed around 10 to the minus 4, consistent with the, the models. The spatial distribution uh, is, as I showed before uh, in the 06, is consistent with observations of other galaxies. Now this, I want to emphasize, the X-ray data refers to the Milky Way. This uh, data here for the oxygen 6 is a sample of uh, other uh, uh, galaxies. Then. Uh, the uh, corona mass we get is around uh, uh, 6 times 10 to the 10th, 75 percent of that is hot. And so uh, we're, in this particular model does explain about 75 percent of the expected number of baryons. I should say that this work is still ongoing, and so we have not uh, explored parameter space yet. Uh, the average metallicity must be high in order for this uh, model to work, and that is consistent with uh, recent observations here by Flachaskadol which show that uh, galactic uh, halos do have uh, a wide range of metallicities, including uh, all, all the way to beyond solar. So the conclusions are that the X-ray and UV uh, data imply that there are these large hot coronae around uh, L-star galaxies, and uh, our model does account for the X-ray observations, both the absorption and emission. We require a high metallicity for this gas, and uh, it accounts for most of the galactic baryons. And, one, and then going back to my earlier talk, one of the interesting implications of the large amount of mass of gas in the corona is that this, there's enough gas in the corona to supply star formation in the galaxy for another, at least another 30 GB years. Thank you. So it is still less significant, less than the Hubble time, but it is uh, covered around. Then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, my uh, uh, thinking is that the dominant heating process, in fact, is probably the uh, growth of Saturday star. The, the, the Fermi, right now, we're seeing an example of the Fermi bubble, but previous Fermi bubbles then are able to expand out to the point that they can get to the uh, entire corona. So this, this simple phenomenological model does not uh, assumes that on average it's going to be able to maintain it in uh, either cycle.
Yeah, so the fountain, and, 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 uh, in the model by fielding and all, that they just included the star formation. So they were essentially doing uh, the, uh, the fountain. <coughs> We've not actually done uh, a model that, I, but I would expect, and based on some models that people done for uh, thermal instability, that it's expected that that gas would fragment into small uh, pieces and uh, should be a pressure state. Uh, but we have not. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, the reason I was curious is because the density differential is not, not that large compared to what I would expect the temperature differential to be. So, uh, yeah, and so uh, uh, that, what, in the, in the current model, we, because we haven't tried to model it yet, we just left, we assumed that that was actually so. When we get to actually the modeling, that's going to be one of the key things because they, these observations of the ultraviolet absorption line do allow you to infer the ionization. <coughs> I started off in uh, A building. I actually, I was here before the uh, Perkins building was completed. Okay. And, yeah. And then uh, it opened up, and so I moved in. And actually, I don't remember exactly which office I was in, but it was. Uh, well, we can take a <laughs> <laughs> so Let's thank you, Chris. Is this, uh, does this go with it? This was here. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's no ITC system. I think I'll just bring mine. Oh, that's probably safe for you. If you need like one of the fancy ones. Oh, no, this is one of the fancy ones. Never mind. Because if you look at super star clusters, there's certainly no evidence of, of uh, multiple. <laughs> Tells me that if I suggest to him how the oh, foundations are formed, he's very willing to spend any time on evolution of the miracle. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know if you figure it out. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's nice to see you again. Nice, nice to see you. Yeah, nice to like. Okay, I will just kind of end then I'll be back here. I'll print your schedule and give it. Oh, yeah. Well, that's an old one. That's an old one. It was. Okay. I'll put on the next one. I'll get you the large one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay.